I'm Aaron from PhoneDog.com, and this could be the biggest dogfight battle of 2012. It's the Apple iPhone 5 and the Samsung Galaxy S3 arch enemies. Let's put them together in a dogfight. It's arguably the biggest dogfight battle of 2012. These are arch enemies. The Apple iPhone 5 and Samsung's Galaxy S3, both flagship devices on their respective manufacturer's side. This is Apple's flagship right now, just released, available in 16, 32, and 64 gigabyte flavors on Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint. Also available in white or black, and the black one has kind of a darkened aluminum here that's kind of coated with a, coated with a darker color. And the biggest issue right now with the black ones is if you scratch it, you can see the lighter aluminum underneath. In other words, the coating uh, comes off. But this is the latest version of Apple's iconic device. Then you have the Samsung Galaxy S3. This has been out since about May, or actually about June internationally, and it hit various carriers in the U.S., five U.S. carriers, actually, uh, later in the year. And so it's been out for a while. It's on Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and U.S. Cellular out of the top five postpaid carriers in the nation, coming to Metro PCS, coming to some prepaid carriers as well. So it's done really well for Samsung. It's a current flagship device, and it really brought them, you know, not to say that the Galaxy S2 wasn't great, but the Galaxy S, or original Galaxy S was kind of rough, Galaxy S2 was great, put them in the international spotlight. Galaxy S3, fantastic in terms of sales, put them ahead in a lot of ways. Note 2 is on its way. Note 2 kind of borrows design themes from the Galaxy S3 and kind of revitalizes the uh, the Note line, at least the Note phablet line of devices with a 5.5 inch display. So we'll be sure to have that review very soon on Phone Dog. In the meantime, though, special thanks to our friends at Best Buy Mobile for giving us devices like the iPhone 5 and the Galaxy S3. We're actually giving these away right now on the website. Thanks to Best Buy Mobile at instantwin.phonedog.com. When you go into Best Buy Mobile, you'll walk out working. They'll help you set up your email, your contacts, your web, your settings, S beam settings and more, or on this case, you do not disturb Siri and more. So when you walk out the door, you're good to go at Best Buy Mobile. So let's take a look at both of these and dive right in. This one, updated in a lot of ways, but it's still the same old look and feel when it comes to iOS. It has iOS 6. It's actually the first iPhone to launch with iOS 6, and it has new specs as well. An Apple A6 dual-core processor that's clocked at 1 gigahertz, a 4-inch Retina display with 326 pixels per inch, and a resolution uh, 640 by 1136 pixels. Over here, 720 by 1280 pixels. Super AMOLED HD display. And then over here, 8 megapixel camera with 1080p HD video recording, a 1,440 milliamp hour non-removable battery here. And then you've got Apple's iOS 6 along with a front-facing uh, HD camera for FaceTime calls. Now, this is also 4G LTE capable, huge for the iPhone community because none of them, with the exception kind of, of the AT&T iPhone 4S, had any 4G capabilities. Now all of them have LTE capabilities out of the gate. So if you're going to market Verizon, AT&T, or Sprint that supports LTE, your iPhone, as you can see here, will take advantage of 4G. The bigger display is also pretty interesting because Apple didn't add any width to the sides of it. They just made it taller. So it looks like somebody took an iPhone and basically rolled it out. It looks a little bit more like a TV remote. Otherwise, though, the design is different. It's nice to have the metal on the back, and it's an absolutely beautiful device. It continues right along in Apple's look and feel department. They do a great job. Say what you will about Apple. Say what you will about iOS. Say what you will about the closed ecosystem, whether you like that or not. But the design of the device itself is absolutely beautiful. Very, very pretty device. Seems to be a little bit more, according to initial tests on the Internet, it seems to be, we always believe what the Internet says, right? Because it's the Internet. According to initial tests on the Internet, it is a little bit less prone to breaking as well, thanks to the metal back. Uh, so be sure to take a look at those around the Internet. Designs change a little bit as well. You've got a nano SIM card slot over here, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, a lightning port, which is the new, uh, the new charging port. And then, of course, you have speaker holes as well. But the charging port is new. It can be turned both ways to plug in and charge. Power button up top. Same stuff over here. You've got your antenna uh, areas here, exit areas for the antennas on both sides. And then you've got your volume rocker and toggle to switch between silent and full volume. Camera on the back, Apple logo. Like I said, taller and a little bit strange because they didn't extend it out, they just made it taller. So design-wise, a little bit funky. It took me a couple of days to get used to it after working with the 4S as long as I did. Then you have the Samsung Galaxy S3 over here, available in two colors, available in uh, blue and white, depending on which US carrier you go with. AT&T also has it in an exclusive red color in the United States. But otherwise, it's packing a 1.5 gigahertz dual-core Snapdragon S4 CPU. <clears throat> Excuse me, a 4.8 inch Super AMOLED HD display, an 8 megapixel camera with 1080p HD video recording, a front facing camera, 2100 milliamp hour battery, Android 4.0 with a new version of TouchWiz as well. They're calling it TouchWiz Nature UX. And you can tell when I turn the sound back on, you can hear, and get that hair off the screen, I don't know where that came from, you can hear the nature effects. 
on this device. Very similar down here as well, physical buttons, although on the Android side, you get two buttons which are hard to see in the camera, but you get a menu button and a back button. And of course, as you can see here, you can search from there by pressing and holding. And you can also access your recent applications by pressing and holding the home button. On the left side, you've got your volume rocker, micro USB charging port on the bottom. Over here, power button, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack up top, and then camera and speaker on the back with Verizon 4G LTE logo in this case. Now, the benefit here is design-wise, regardless of whether you're on AT&T or you're on Sprint, you're looking at these devices, the designs look exactly the same on both sides. With the exception of the red color, these look identical, so if you're comparing these on Sprint on AT&T, yeah, the network performances are going to differ a little bit because these are obviously both Verizon devices, but you can get a nice, accurate comparison here between the two units, with the exception, obviously, of like Verizon pre-installed applications as opposed to AT&T pre-installed applications over here. So obviously, Apple, no AT&T pre-installed stuff or Verizon pre-installed or Sprint pre-installed stuff over here. On the uh, Galaxy S3, you do get some carrier bloatware, depending on which model you go with, but over here, you'll see all share play, Amazon Kindle, but then you'll see some Verizon stuff as well, guided tours, mobile hotspot, my Verizon mobile, and then Google Play, of course, visual voicemail, $299 per month from Verizon, VZ Navigator, VCast Tones, VPN Client, uh, and more. So you get that stuff out of the gate on the Galaxy S3. Over here, new iOS 6 improvements include Passbook, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the review. Passbook is an easy way to get all of your boarding passes, your movie tickets, and more in one place on the iPhone 5. And you know, while it's still not quite functional yet, at least in terms of the rollout, I'm hoping that they'll do more with it because you can get your tickets and select applications right now, but I'd love the ability to see a little bit more out of the gate. Maybe my frequent flyer information or uh, just additional specs from Walgreens or from Target or from United or from American, etc. So hopefully they'll uh, enhance that as time goes on. Otherwise, applications that I've installed, and obviously, 3.5 inch display moving to a 4 inch display means some challenges when it comes to sizing applications and you'll see in a lot of instances on the iPhone 4, or I mean on the 5 rather, versus the 4S, you can see that the size of the applications, you'll notice some black space around where it's optimized for a 3.5 inch display as opposed to one that is already optimized for a 4 inch display as you can see here that takes up the full size of the screen. The downside over on the iPhone 5, no widget support. So over here, for example, you'll see a bunch of different options for widgets, a Google search bar, for example, and then you'll see this over here. And I will say out of all the Android user interfaces, TouchWiz has undergone drastic improvements and it's really fantastic on the Galaxy S3, the Galaxy Note 2. It was almost there on the Galaxy S2. Now they've gone over and beyond, in my opinion, with the Galaxy S3 and with the Galaxy Note 2, which will come out later in the year. Absolutely love the look and feel. It works really well with Android. They've really optimized the software and you can see it's fast with little to no lag whatsoever. I have no problems with lag on the Galaxy S3, both the international version and surprisingly on the US version, the Snapdragon S4 CPU works really, really well over here. So you can see your calendar, for example, you can see Samsung's calendar, and then of course the stock Android calendar. So I can bring all this stuff out here onto the home screen, one of the seven home screens, for example. And I've got a calendar widget right there. I've got an email widget. I can easily access those and see it. You don't get that level of customization over here, but the trade-off in a lot of ways is often battery life. Now, the battery life sizes are dramatically different over here, 1,440 milliamp hour battery here, which Apple quotes actually as being better than the iPhone 4S despite having LTE. Over here, 2,100 milliamp hour removable battery. So if you have spares, you can take them out and put in a full one and be good to go back along on your day. That said, non-removable over here, and we'll go back over to widgets so you can take a look. But that kind of functionality you don't get over here on the iPhone 5 and on iOS 6. The most you get in terms of the kind of the widgets department, you get Charlotte local, or I mean, you don't get Charlotte local weather unless you live in Charlotte, but you get a local weather kind of widgety thing over here. And then you get stocks as well out of the notifications area. And then of course here, you can integrate Facebook, you can integrate Twitter, as you can see down here in the settings. And I can access, for example, Twitter, I'll plug in phone dog underscore Aaron. Uh, let's do that. Let me put in my password so you can see what it looks like. And we'll sign in there, and that apparently is not correct. Uh, maybe I can remember if I can remember my password. Let's see here. There we go, bingo. We'll install the app later, but now you can see I have the ability to tap to tweet, and I can do the same thing with Facebook directly from the notifications area. So that kind of integration is nice over here as well. And there are a wealth of improvements in iOS 6, which we'll talk about largely in part two of this video, along with the upgrades and improvements in TouchWiz and Android 4.0. This is supposed to get Jelly Bean. It's already rolling out internationally. should be coming soon to the United States once carriers improve it, or once they approve it, excuse me. 
And then of course you've got your Verizon Wireless ongoing notification over here. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves with the Verizon version of this device because you see Wi-Fi off over here. It doesn't give you the ability to remove that. For example, it stays in the ongoing area and much like typical Galaxy S3 stuff, you've got all of your different settings up here, but on most of them, AT&T, for example, T-Mobile, Sprint, you have Wi-Fi up here in the top left-hand corner. Well, Verizon's taking it under their good graces. They believe that you should use Wi-Fi at all times. They believe that they know better than you when you should use Wi-Fi. And so, of course, ongoing Wi-Fi is right here. You cannot get rid of this notification. Even when you turn Wi-Fi off, even when you say keep Wi-Fi off during sleep, or keep Wi-Fi on during sleep, never. Don't want it to auto-connect. Turn all that stuff off still. It's right there in the notifications bar. Kind of a pet peeve, especially when it's ongoing here, and then of course your notifications pop in below. And by default, you know, you kind of scroll down in a hurry and you immediately click Wi Fi. I can't tell you how many times in my testing of the Verizon unit I've done that. And it's just annoying because every time you click it, it automatically turns Wi Fi back on, as you can see right here. So kind of frustrating there. Don't care for that. I would love to be able to turn on Wi Fi as I see fit. So let's take a look quickly in part one at the messaging capabilities of both of these devices because I want to show you the keyboards on both. Four inch display here, 4.8 inch display here. Somehow, some way, Steve Jobs said 3.5 inches was the perfect uh, size for humans. Now it's magically gone to four, so I'm assuming either our hands have gotten bigger or somehow we've magically decided that something is better. Over here, 4.8 inch Super AMOLED HD display. Nice and large. That said, this may be too big for some, but it's still relatively easy. And I have big hands, granted, but I can still wrap my hands around this device and even from holding it at the bottom, I can still mostly get to the top. Same thing over here. You can hold it and easily access the top and the corners of the device. Typical iOS keyboard here, no real changes from iOS 5 and from the iPhone 4S over to iOS 6 and the iPhone 5. Over here you've got Samsung's revised keypad, which of course portrait to landscape transitions nice and fast on both of these devices and you get a very fluid uh, user interface over here again. Again, if you watch my review though, you notice that I had some issues with the keyboard and with overall typing on this device. So we'll try Quick Brown Fox Party like it is 1999, or 19, hey, even better, 1990. Quick Round Fox is ready to party like it's 1990, and again, because of the elongated display, when you go into landscape mode, you'd think you'd have more space, but take a look here again, it's very much the same keyboard, and they've got a, a bunch of gray area over here where it's not really enhancing the display or enhancing the, the keys and making them larger. You're just ending up with a lot of dead space on both sides of the keyboard, which to me is a little bit useless. Over here, you've got portrait and landscape, obviously. Samsung's keypad is a twofer, is what I like to call it, because you can do two things. You can do a swipe-like functionality, but or buttery three instead of hey there, and, or you can go back and do it like this in typical hunt and peck, which is what I prefer. Out of the gate, you do get the Samsung keyboard, you get Google Voice typing, and that is it. But again, back to the Wi-Fi thing, you can see here it's kind of activated and said wireless network available. Biggest pet peeve in the world because even when you have it turned off and it auto detects, for example, if I turn on my office Wi-Fi and plug it in and activate it over here, even if I turn Wi-Fi off, it still auto activates when I walk back into the office. The most annoying thing in the history of the world. Well, maybe not in the history of the world, but at least in the history of cell phones, maybe. It's definitely up there in the top five frustrating things. LTE on both of these devices, Verizon promises download speeds of 5 to 12 megabits per second, upload speeds of 2 to 5 megabits per second, and in testing, it's nice and fast. PhoneDog.com loading up on both of these devices. I'll type it in over here. As you can see, typical iPhone look and feel, and this is the interesting thing for a lot of people. You know, it's all about ecosystems, and I talked about this a lot in the review, so I won't ruin it for you again in the dogfight. Go back and take a look at the iPhone 5 review, but it's all about ecosystems in 2012. Whether you're tied into the iTunes ecosystem and need an iPhone 5, or you're tied into the Android slash Google ecosystem for Gmail, for Google Voice, for whatever, Chrome, whatever the case may be, and you need an Android device, that's a huge part of consumers' buying decisions right there, which one they're more integrated and tied into. That said... Improvements on both sides. That said, this one's a little bit stale. I keep saying that said a lot, but uh, that said, this one is uh, a little bit more stale, a little bit more long in the tooth because it's looked almost exactly the same for years, despite having some nice enhancements. Over here, on the other hand, Android obviously looks different depending on which manufacturer you're working with because of the user interfaces. And of course, TouchWiz has undergone some drastic changes. And what I love about the Galaxy S3, the software, you know, because Android, let's be honest, there's a dime a dozen, or they are a dime a dozen, rather, a ton of Android devices out there. The One X, Galaxy S3, the Evo 4G LTE, all of Motorola's devices, the Droid Razor M, the Droid Razor Max HD, all the stuff that's coming out, Windows Phone, they've got to distinguish it now over software because let's be honest, most of these devices are packing dual core Snapdragon S4 CPUs or in the case of Apple's custom solution, uh, their custom A6 processor, but it's getting kind of boring. So they've got to distinguish over software. So you're seeing a lot of really cool software things pop up that I'm absolutely loving. Things like Do Not Disturb on iOS 5. We'll go over here so you can take a look 
and do not disturb. You can go in here to notifications and configure it where when it's scheduled, you can turn it on from 12 to 6, for example, and from 12 a.m. to 6, only your favorite people can call you or only everyone or only no one. And then, of course, repeated calls, you can make it where if somebody calls twice in a row, it'll automatically ring, but it silences your phone for you. Cool features like that. And the one that I never thought I would use, and I absolutely use so much on the Galaxy S3 that it would be hard for me to get rid of this phone, is S-Beam. S-Beam is one of the most phenomenal applications, most phenomenal software features that I've ever used in my entire life because I'm a, I'm a picture taker sometimes, other times I'm not. So when I'm with somebody with a Galaxy S3, we're at a wedding, we're at a friend's house, we're hanging out, we're doing whatever, anybody with a Galaxy S3 can turn on S-Beam put the devices back to back and sync up pictures, playlists, and more. So there have been countless times here where I have, I have family and friends and significant others that have these devices, and there have been plenty of times where I'm like, okay, I didn't take any pictures of this event. Can you send me your pictures? It's like, sure. Bam, synced up and ready to go. So I absolutely love that feature on the Galaxy S3. And you see a lot of great software features both on iOS 6 and on the Galaxy S3, which we'll cover more in part two. So on that note, stay tuned. The second part of the video is coming back. And we'll be sure to tell you which one's the best, iPhone 5 or Galaxy S3. Stay tuned for part two.